Hey everybody, Casey Muratori here, and Molly Bean, of course, who wanted to be part of the introduction to these videos, apparently. So she's she's here with us as well. Uh, I posted a lecture that was given to the University of Twente, and people had some follow-up questions about it. Specifically, at the end of that, I showed a slide that had some code on it, and people wanted me to maybe elaborate on that a little more. So I recorded some videos, and I've broken it up into two parts where I discuss how the assembly language works, how the CPU works, that sort of thing. So if you are interested in more detail from the previous lecture, here it is. And there will be a second part as well. And also, uh, if you haven't watched that video yet and you want to see that one first, I put the link in the description. Of course, this is part of our Kickstarter series, so I've also got the link to the Kickstarter down there. Please check it out if you get a chance. But uh, without further ado, here is the follow-up to the University of Twente lecture, part one, where I basically go through a very simplified model of CPUs so that you can kind of understand basically how to think about them at a high level. So I had a request uh, based on the lecture that I posted from the University of uh, Twente. And in that lecture, I basically laid out some code at the end. And I said, you know, here's what the whole thing boils down to is effectively just these few lines of code. And I showed an assembly language version of the code as well, just so people could see how simple it actually was, the task that was being done, once you boil it down to what the CPU actually needs to do. And the reason that I was showing that code uh, in that lecture, because that lecture was not super technical, it was like medium technical. The reason I was showing that code is not because I thought that many people who watched it would necessarily know what the assembly language was, but rather to underscore that when you actually take a look at what the computer needed to do in the circumstances of that particular problem and solving that particular problem, it not only went from like thousands of lines of C code down to just a few lines of C code for the actual part that does the work, but those few lines of C code actually translate to very few actual processor operations. And so my goal there was just to kind of give you an idea of just how simple some of these things are that we're doing, and yet we ship code that is orders of magnitude, many, many, like not one or two orders of magnitude, but like sometimes like three or four orders of magnitude, more actual work than the work that needed to be done. And all that rest of the work is just, it's, it's wasted, right? It was just wasted work that you had a CPU do that it that didn't need to do. But some people who looked at that assembly language code were like, can you go into more detail about that, which is great. I love it if people are interested in seeing some of these uh, things. So what I want to do is now just go over what that code actually did in assembly language and show how you can look at it and understand it. This is actually a very important thing for programmers to do. I wish more programmers did it, because if you learn assembly language for whatever processor you ship on most often, you don't have to become uh, you know, a polymath about assembly languages or whatever, where you know like all kinds of them or anything like that. But if you learn just a little bit of how the assembly language works on the processors that you care about, you can start to learn about how those processors actually process the instruction streams that you give them, and that gives you a tremendously uh, better, it gives you a much better chance of knowing how slow your code is relative to what it should be. Because if you don't understand the, the base, like those low-level operations, you don't understand how bad the software is. You might not really be that slow, or you may be incredibly slow compared to what you should be, and you just have no way of knowing. So that's really what the benefit is of learning things at this level. It's not that you have to go do things at this level all the time. That may be beneficial to you sometimes, but a lot of times the benefit in knowing how the CPU works and what it's actually doing doesn't have anything to do with the fact that you're ever going to actually go write assembly language. It has to do with understanding what your code is doing and why it might be very slow compared to what it could be. So what I want to do is draw a very simple, like the simplest possible, um, CPU diagram. So this is not the simplest possible CPU, but it's the simplest possible CPU diagram that gets you in a, a like mental framework for thinking about how you uh, are thinking about how your code will like flow through the processor at a base level. So typically there's a thing called a front end. Uh, and these are loose terms. 
they don't really mean anything probably in hardware. If you were a hardware person, you might, you probably still might say things like front end, but I don't know that you really think of it quite that way. In when we're looking at sort of this this big picture, we just kind of think of the front end and we kind of bin a bunch of things in there and we just vaguely kind of have an idea of what it does, but we maybe don't know all the specifics. Now, one of the reasons that we don't know all the specifics is because modern chips are actually very proprietary, and a lot of times we may literally not know the specifics. Meaning Intel doesn't wish to disclose to us how these exactly work, or AMD doesn't want to tell us, right? Because it's their technology, it's the stuff they work on. They don't want to give secrets to their competitors or whatever else. So they may tell us things about like the front end, or things about what happens in the chip. But they are probably not going to give us all of the specifics. So when we say front end, we're referring to the first part of taking what your code does and turning it into actual work that the CPU is going to do. Now, what the front end does is it takes as input an instruction stream. So effectively, what's happening is there is an instruction stream. And it is being fed into this front end. Now, this actual action, this instruction stream, is that's what we call assembly language a lot of the time, right? The instruction stream is basically the machine encoding, like the binary version of the assembly language that we would talk about in one of these circumstances. So when we say instruction stream, we just mean here are literally the instructions that we're telling the CPU to do. Those are basically what you've seen if you've ever seen assembly language, and we're gonna look at that after. So if you've never seen assembly language before, I'll show you what it means, uh, or how to read it, I should say. But basically, the binary encoding, like in the memory of the computer, there are encodings of each thing that the CPU will do at that low level, and this is going to get fed into the front end, and that's where the work is going to begin. Now, even just this operation of getting the instruction stream into the front end has a lot of complexity to it. The front end has to actually access memory, the memory of the computer, to get the instructions out of it, and because getting instructions. As an actual thing to do, can itself be a slow part of the process of running your code. This actually involves a a cache. So there's typically a thing here, and there's multiple levels of this cache potentially. There's typically a thing in here. It's sometimes right written i dollar sign, right? That's a that's an i there. Um, it's or called an i cache. But basically, what it is is it's a cache. That re remembers instruction pages. So, if you've never looked at caches before, I'm not really going to go into what they are because that's a completely different talk. But basically, there is a thing that remembers pages of memory that it's looked at before for fetching instructions. That's the closest thing you have in the front end that you can go to to ask what to run. So every time the front end is basically thinking about, okay, I need to go get some instructions so I can execute them. Uh, it's first going to look into caches, and then if it doesn't find it in the cache, it's going to ask like a next level cache. So there'd be like an L2 or an L3 or whatever. You know, it propagates out just like data. But there, but by the time we get to the front end, we're talking about that. There's actually a a specific cache just for instructions. Data does not go in here. It's not part of the cache that we talk about when we talk about cache coherency for data. That's a different cache, usually called D star or the data cache or L uh, L one or whatever, right? So this is its own thing. There's additional caches in many chips. There's oftentimes things called a loop cache or you know. Hot cat. I don't know what you what you want to call them. There's these caches that are for other things as well, and they're made for really specific high acceleration scenarios. And so let me talk a little bit about what these two things do. So the front end, right, is the first thing that's going to do this work, and what it wants to do is it wants to get the instructions that it's going to execute, but it needs to get them from memory. And so it needs to cache them because going to memory is slow. So it has an i cache, and that i cache is just the bytes that the instruction that that there are are in memory. It's just pulling them closer. So the i cache is really no different than the instruction stream in memory. It's the same bits, right? They just moved closer so that they can be accessed. Why are they cached? They're cached because hey, your code tends to be local. If you're calling this function a lot. Then you don't want to go to memory to get that function every time. You just want it to be resident here in the iCache, so it can just be got. Right? It's the same principle as caching for data. So the iCache stores things just to just to save that round trip. 
There are other caches like loop caches, and they take care of the next step of the process and making that a little bit faster in certain scenarios. So let's talk about what happens next. When the front end says, I'm going to get some new instructions, what it actually needs are not the actual instructions you wrote. This is one of the big changes that has happened in the past 20 years on consumer CPUs. It used to be that processors just executed the instructions you gave them. So if you imagined the front end, if it pulled something, even if it was caching, if it pulled something into a cache and it looked at the instructions, it could just execute those instructions that were there. But that doesn't happen anymore. Now what happens is each instruction is first turned into other instructions, possibly more than one instruction. And those are actually called UOPs. So there's a decoder part here. And the decoder's job is to take things out of you know, the, the instruction stream that's the raw stream you gave it and to turn them into UOPs or microops. It's written like that, uh, the little mu, like the micro symbol. So that's why they're called UOPs because it kind of looks like a U. Eh, you know. Anyway, microops or UOPs, the decoder's job is to turn these instructions into sort of like smaller instructions. And the reason for that is the instruction sets designed by uh, the original people who designed like x86 or whatever, some of them are very complicated and it started to become easier to execute them by breaking them into smaller instructions. So that's one reason. But another reason is because it may be more efficient to sort of compress the representation of the instructions, because remember, there's a cache and memory fetching is expensive. So if we can shrink the size of our instruction stream down, that may actually be a win for just the act of getting the streams. So when we get the instruction stream, we may want it in a form that is more macro, is more, is the instructions mean to do more and are more uh, sort of uh, concisely described. And then we will break them into UOPs using the decoder, right? So basically parsing this, decoding it, turning it into microops that the processor can now uh, actually use, um, that's where things like a loop cache or trace cache, there's a lot of different kinds of caches that names they use. I'm not really a hardware guy, so I'm not going to sit here and try to uh, tell you that there's right terms or anything like, you know, You'd have to ask a hardware person to, to know if there's specifics about that. But point being, uh, for microops or uops, uh, they will then sometimes be sort of like stored in a secondary cache that caches the result of decoding. Because sometimes decoding instructions can actually be the bottleneck in loops where the instructions are cheap to execute, where the microops themselves are very cheap, and the bottleneck is getting those microops into the processor. If you have to go through the decoder every time, that might be too slow. So sometimes you have these caches that are designed to just remember the microops after decoding so that when we're running that code, it can run much faster, right? Okay. Um, so then to a very, very, oh, you know what? That's going to go too low. I've, I've done it now, haven't I? I've done it now. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll scroll down a little bit. Maybe we'll just scroll down just, just, a, just a hair. What do you think about scrolling down? Just a, just a touch, a little, just a little, you know what I mean, of scroll. Um, so if we imagine another box here, uh, and we'll call this, uh, you know, the, the back end. Um, so up here we've got this idea of we're grabbing instructions. They're going through a cache because we may not be able to afford to, catch, to go out to memory to get them every time, obviously. We're going through a decoder. We're turning them into microops. We may store those microops in a cache, right? And then when we actually know what kind of uh, microops, the actual microops that we're going to execute, we will then send those uh, sort of off to actually be done, right? They're actually gonna, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna do something. Up here, we've done nothing effectively. Like we, we all we're doing uh, is trying to figure out what microops to run, and that's the entire job of the front end, basically. Now, there's some other stuff that happens in here uh, for efficiency purposes. Some of these are things like uh, handling like jumps, 
So, like, if one of the things that happened here was, like, a branch, like, let's say we're in a while loop, and we get to the end of the while loop, we have to go back to the top of the while loop. Well, we don't actually want to send that to the back end because all that jump does is tell us where to get more instructions, and getting more instructions is the front end. So we don't want to send that micro up all the way down through here and wait for it to execute and then send it all the way back to the front end to tell it where to get the new instructions from because the front end would have to be sitting around doing nothing. It could have been decoding instructions all that time. So typically there's like a bunch of stuff in here as well, which is like, you know, jump handling and like stack handling. Like there's all these things in here where if there's just rote stuff happening in the stream, branch prediction, like, hey, uh, I, I see a, a, a conditional jump. I'm going to try and guess where it goes. All of that stuff happens up in the front end because the front end is trying to bring in the new instructions. So it's just going to do, and in fact, you know, you may wonder why there is such a thing as branch prediction. You, you may have heard about that, like branch predictor this, branch predictor that. This is a mispredicted branch, blah, blah, blah. What does that mean? Well, this is the problem. If I'm trying to do all of this work up in the front end and make sure I'm just generating all of these UOPs to do, it means that when I see a branch, the front end would come to a screeching halt. If it couldn't guess what work to keep looking for, where to go to look for more UOPs, it would have to wait for the back end to get to that branch to know whether it gets taken or not, right? So what happens is all of that branch prediction logic is to try and keep the front end going. And you may ask, why do I have to keep the front end going? Why can't I just wait for the back end to do it? Because as we're about to see, the back end is now massively latent. The back end is designed to take a ton of microops in, like tens, sometimes hundreds of microops in at a time, right? So it's it's many, many, many cycles to get from to, to get through the entire buffer in the back end. So if you actually were talking about putting in something like a branch into the back end and waiting for it to the back end to get to it it would flush that entire huge pipeline and stall everything. Every, the whole chip would grind to a halt while the back end is just turning away, and so just the back end's working. And then when it finally gets to that branch, it would be like, hey, front end, I got to the branch. What do I do now? And it's like, I have no idea. I was waiting for you to tell me. And then the chip starts back up again, and now the front end can go grab some things, and right? So the idea here be behind things like uh, handling jumps directly in the front end and having branch prediction, so conditional jumps can be handled as well. We'll also see there's a thing called macro op fusion that happens here, and the whole reason that happens is basically because the front end wants to be able to handle conditional jumps so that it can look and see where things are going to, to be. So that's what a branch predictor is there for. It's there to keep the front end going so the back end doesn't have to be a bottleneck on decoding and getting micro ops in. Similarly, um, you can also think of of um, that that whole process, like you know, where where we're decoding all these UOPs and we're we're, we're feeding them in, uh, and you've got things like like uh, you know branch prediction and all that other sort of stuff. Uh, actually, let me just I don't know what that was doing there. I think I was about to write back end there. Um, so you know, uh, you can think about all of that stuff that's happening as uh, yeah, as as sort of like informing you as to why a lot of these things you've heard about are like are happening, right? Um, it's also things like I don't know if you've ever heard weird stuff about like oh jumps should be aligned to this byte boundary or whatever. They're all just because the front end is doing stuff, right? The front end is doing a bunch of stuff to try and make sure that the UOPs are always flowing through as fast as they can so that the back end is always has something to work on. And so because the logic in the front end is like approximate, it, it's not actually doing much computation because that's the back end's job and that's where all those circuitries are. It's doing a lot of guessing and it's doing a lot of approximate work. So you can't expect it to just always know things. So that's where like branch prediction, uh, misprediction penalties and stuff come from is because if the front end guess is wrong, all the work it's generated is also wrong. So it basically has to pause, roll on back to where to, to back to where it did the branch and start again. Right. Okay. So once we generate these UOPs, the UOPs go into the back end, and effectively what's gonna happen now is we're gonna use those UOPs to uh, sort of fill up a series of what are called execution ports typically. And what these are are 
these are the things that actually do the work in the CPU. They're arithmetic logic units or whatever you need uh, to do certain kinds of UOPS. So typically what you have is some kind of a system that's got some number of these ports. Um, they're called ports. Uh, but you can think of them as execution units. Port is kind of a weird hardware term, I guess, that you know doesn't really give you much in intuition of what they do. Uh, but basically, these are just things that can do work. They are units where if you feed it a particular micro-op, the source and the destination of the micro-op, it will produce the result. So the way to think about this is let's suppose you have something concrete like add. If you want to add two integers together, well, one or more of these ports has an adder circuit in it, an actual circuit that will take two things, two inputs of binary did, you know, bits, and it will produce the correct binary bit output for an add operation. Now, we know that we're generating UOPs. Those UOPs have things in them like add. A typical UOP would be something like add, XOR, add, sub. Some of them can be more complicated. You can even have UOPs that are like floating point multiply add in one step, right? So you can definitely have UOPs that are complicated or not complicated depending on what these ports support. And specifically, all of the things that the ports support are the UOPs that will be flowing. Some UOPs never flow to the back end, like things like a jump UOP is going to be immediately interpreted just by the front end. They never really go to the back end. But most of these UOPs, they all go to the back end, and they are targeted towards some port, the set of ports that can do it. Now, some ports can only do certain things, and other ports can only do other things. So typically, the ports are not homogenous. Even in highly homogenous processors, like Zen 3 or whatever, they typically are still segregated between maybe like general purpose and a uh, wide vector unit or something, right? So typically, there is at least some breakdown of what the kinds of ports are, such that, for example, maybe an add uh, can happen on all of these ports, but a multiply can only happen on the first two ports, and the other ones don't have a multiplier, or they don't have a floating point multiplier, or they don't have a divide, because divide is kind of expensive, so divide's only on one port, and everyone else can do a multiply, but the only person who can do divide is this port, right? So the ports vary from processor to processor. They're completely different between not just Intel and AMD, but also between individual steppings, uh, not steppings is the wrong term, individual microarchitectures. So if you have a, a Skylake versus a you know, Ice Lake, the ports are different. So which particular CPU you have, it doesn't just matter who manufactured it. It also matters which version of their architecture it was on, what these look like changes. And you'll see that when we go look at these things in detail after I finish the whiteboard part, I'm sorry, lightboard part. You'll see that because we'll actually, you'll note that in the tools that you use to look at these things, you always have to pick your microarchitecture. Because until you know what microarchitecture you're looking at, you have no idea how instructions will be scheduled. Now, when this comes in, UOPs are typically of a particular form. And I'm just going to write down sort of what they look like pseudocode wise. Uh, and pseudocode wise, they actually look quite a bit like uh, an assembly language structure. So if you already know assembly language, then microops are basically just like a finer grained assembly language, right? So you kind of already know what they are. But if you have no idea, if you've never looked at assembly language before, typically what a UOP is, is you have a like the type of the UOP, like what thing you're doing. Um, you have like a destination for the UOP, where you want to put the results, and then you have a source, right? And you may have several of these. So there may be like up to three sources, depending on the processor and the type of uh, instruction set that you're working with. So the type uh, of the UOP that you're doing, again, would be something like, you know, uh, let's say we have like an integer add, right? So we're going to integer add these things. The destination is going to be, you know, we can think of it as a register name, but as we're going to get to in a second, it's not really a register name. Um, so I, I guess I would prefer to think of it as more like a slot. Um, and then the sources are also slots, right? So when we think of a UOP, it's like, what did you want to do? Integer add. Where do you want me to put the result? In this slot. 
where do I get the two things to add these slots, right? Um, so this would be like slot. I should probably just say slot dot dot dot, right? So we're gonna we're gonna list these, right? Shouldn't have said slots. Let's just say slot. All right. Um, so what happens now is when these UOPs are flowing from the front end, they're first going to be in a form that doesn't have the slots assigned. The slots are going to be unassigned. So when the UOP comes in, what it has is the name you gave it. So you'll see in the instruction streams when we look at the things when you say like add, not the not the microop, not the UOPs, but the assembly language instruction add. It will have register names in it. Those register names will be things like R8 or RAX or whatever, right? They're just register names, and there's some number of register names, or maybe there's 16 register names. So when you see something, it will look like the UOP form, actually. It will look quite a bit like that. And it will say something like add RAX RAX or something like that, which is like add RAX to itself and put the result in RAX or something like that, right? That RAX doesn't actually refer to any physical thing in the processor anymore. It used to. Long ago, assembly language used to be written such that the processor's uh, instructions encoded actual register names that meant a particular place on the processor that stored the contents of that register. So when you saw something like, you know, well, there wouldn't have been an RAX back then, but AX or whatever back then, it meant a specific storage place on the chip. So a register was a real register. It was a real thing, a place where you put stuff. So assembly language streams were saying, I need you to read something from this register and that register and add it and put it in this register or something, right? That is not what happens anymore. Now what happens is the UOP comes in here and it's got register names that you said, RAX, RCX, whatever. It then goes into something called a register allocation table or, I mean, I, it's written RAT, but it's oftentimes the you can see people using different acronym expansions for RAT. So, uh, uh, so it is a rat, but I don't know what rat stands for, and nobody else does either. So let's say it means register allocation table for now, but your mileage may vary because people assign the RAT to different things uh, depending on what the circumstance is. So the first thing what happens is the micro op goes into a thing called a register allocation table, and the register allocation table is going to translate those names that you gave to names that correspond to these slots that I was talking about. So the register allocation table is massively bigger. I don't know how big it is. I don't remember in Skylake. We can look it up. But like, let's say it's like 192. I, I think it's somewhere around there, 196, 192. I don't know what it is. So there may be something like 200 slots, right, in this register allocation table. So just keep that in mind now in your brain. When you go look at assembly language, there's like 16 registers or something like that, right? And if you count vector registers, maybe there's 32 registers or something, right? There's 32 registers, but there's 190-something entries in a modern register allocation table, maybe more to, you know, on even newer chips, right? So what's going on here? Well, this part of the process is where we start to get to that deep buffering I was talking about. So somewhere along the lines, when people started doing you know, modern CPU design, they really needed longer pipelines to get things to go as fast as they could, right? The reason for this is if you think about typically what you do in you know an average function when you're actually running stuff, and we'll actually see this happening in the function that we're going to look at later, even in that such a simple function, this, this happens, happens everywhere, is in any given instruction stream, there's often things that can be executed in parallel. So for example, let's suppose that I'm going to add two numbers together, and I'm going to add two other numbers together, and then I'm going to add the result of those two things as a third add. Well, the first two adds, right, are completely independent. I don't need the result of the first add or the result of the second add to affect each other. It's only when I get to the next, you know, that third add that combines the two that they actually come together and have a dependency.
So what's actually happening in this kind of design is we're trying to extract that parallelism. We don't want to wait for the first ad to complete before starting the second ad because we have more resources on the CPU than we can use. So what we're trying to do here is fill up a big, big window of things we could be doing so that if we can find anything that we can assign to spare CPU resources, something that's not being used right now, one of these ports that's, that's not busy, right? I can grab that thing, even if it's not the next instruction. No matter where it is, I want to be able to grab it and start working on it because if I have everything I need to start it, I want to start it, right? So what this register allocation table is trying to do is it's trying to say, well, look, this person wrote instructions that were like, you know, add RAX to RAX, add RCX to RCX, then put something else in RAX. I want to be working at all, on all of those simultaneously. I want to be doing all these things. And I only want to wait, I only want operations in the stream to wait if the thing they needed is still being worked on. I don't want to wait for things that I don't need to wait for, right? So in order to do that, I need to start remembering what, where in flight each of these registers is right now, right? Because I can't just go through the instruction stream one at a time. I'm going to be like way down here and something way up at the top hasn't finished yet. I need to know if it's done, if the thing that, that you know, this thing says it needs the input that was being generated way up here. I need to know if that's done. But, by, but we've done a whole bunch of other stuff since then, so I need to track all that. So the register allocation table's uh, job is to basically expand your instruction stream into independent dependency chains that just use these slots for storage, these 192 or however many there are, 196, I don't remember, all of these slots, circa 200, to decompose that terse 16 instruction, uh, 16 register stream into something much more verbose that involves lots more registers than that. Right. So what it's going to do is it's going to translate this. It's going to go in here. It's going to assign a new slot for whatever the destination is. So we're going to find some unused slot in the register allocation table and say that's where the destination is going. Then we're going to look in the register allocation table for the sources of this thing and see if they're available. Right. And what we're going to do is we're going to take whatever their you know whatever their status is and we're going to see if we can execute this instruction now or not. Right. If we can execute the instruction, then we're going to start looking to see if there's a port that it can go on. If we can't, it will just get held until we see that the inputs that it needs are done computing. Uh, and so that's what you know we call a scheduler. The scheduler is the thing that basically like determines when to issue things to ports, Right, And then when things finish up on the ports, they go back and they kind of like put their results back into the register allocation table. Okay, pause that for one second. One thing I do here that's not really great, it's a little misleading, it's actually how I think about it, but it's not how it actually works quite in practice, is I draw a line back up to the register allocation table. Now that's not really true. The actual values are sort of in the scheduler, they're sort of in with the other part. So it never really has to talk to the register allocation table again. This will be clear in a second, because after we go through this, I'm going to show you the actual full diagram of the CPU from an actual diagram from Wikichips, and that will make it 100% clear. But just in case you're like going to take this much too, too much to heart, I would say, uh, pretend I didn't quite draw that arrow right to the RAT. Pretend I drew it kind of back just as a closed loop on itself to the scheduler because that's that's more what actually happens. So, and which feeds back into the scheduler, which says, hey, anything that was waiting on this result, you can now start issuing. So it will start issuing those instructions that were pending, right? Um, and then finally, there's a big old thing on the side uh, that's called the retirement buffer. Right. Um, I don't actually know what the technical term for it is. It's it's basically like a retirement window thing. And what happens is, no matter how crazily we picked out micro ops in there to execute, we actually always retire them in order. So there's a giant window that we just start writing uops in as they are finished in the slot where they actually need to go. So we're actually going to make sure that they get retired in the same order that they came in. So during this whole process, they're all out of order and wacky, but then they all get reordered back into the correct order in the retirement buffer.
for completion, right? So this is the basic model of what's going on. And believe it or not, as kind of crazy as all that sounded, that's the simple version, right? That's the simple version of what's actually going on. The more complex version is actually even more nuts. Hopefully that's a reasonable enough approximation to refer to in your head, uh, and then that made some sense. Um, but now let's go look at the actual complicated version really quickly before we dive into our code so you can see what I mean. So here, uh, what you can see is this is an instruction, this, this is the front end diagram that actually is provided, uh, like you can go get these on Wikichip for any chip, for example. Um, and I believe these are just sort of generally what the manufacturer of the chip has sort of said is happening. Again, we don't really get super detailed information about what chips do because they're very proprietary and, and the actual exact designs aren't usually shared. But we usually get some kind of approximate diagram from the manufacturer uh, when they give their presentations at uh, conferences like hot chips or, you know, uh, those kind of things where they, where they disclose some details. They typically show things like this. Now, this is the uh, the diagram for the Skylake microarchitecture. And the reason that I picked that is because it's the kind of machine that the witness grass planting thing, uh, that that uh, it, it's, the, it's a CPU that would have been involved in the thing that I was talking about in the original simple code lecture. So I thought I would use that because uh, that you know is, is the right thing for, for that time period. Now, right off the bat, you can see what I mean, right? Register, register alias table is what they call rat. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I wasn't joking, right? When I said register allocation table might be the right wrong thing for it if you, uh, depending on who you ask, everyone says this differently. So, you know, feel free to make up your own definition for rat. No one will really be able to, to criticize you for it because it is so inconsistent how it is labeled. But so you can see here, basically the diagram is the same as the one I drew. There is the back end here and the front end here, but you can see it's so much more complicated than what I said. Now you can see a bunch of the things that I was talking about, right? But you can see there's a lot more stuff. So this is the I cache that I talked about, the I dollar sign thing, the L1 instruction cache. Um, and as you can see, it's dedicated to just instructions. Now, this is to distinguish it from something like an L2 or L3 cache that are typically shared. They typically, the L2 cache stores any page of memory. So whether the request comes from the L1 instruction cache or the L1 data cache, it would all go through the L2, right? Um, but you can see here that when we're talking about something like this, when you get this far down to the very core execution, like the, the very like uh, nuts and bolts of the CPU, the caches are, are now split apart. They're split apart into one for instructions and one for data. And you can see the data one uh, down here, right? So there's the L1 cache uh, for data. So they're actually completely different. But both of them talk to like the same L2, right? And that's because that's just a unified cache. Now you can see lots of other stuff here. I'll just talk about what some of these things are real briefly. You can see here there's like the branch vector I was talking about. You can see there's an instruction TLB. What's that? Well, that's the thing that does virtual address translation for you because basically, uh, remember, it, we, we in modern times, almost all code is executing in a virtual address space that doesn't actually correspond to physical memory. As a result, every time you want to look up something in memory, you actually have to figure out first which physical address it corresponds to because the address you're going to have in, in your actual instruction stream and that you store pointers for and that are in registers, all stuff, are all going to be virtual addresses. So it takes time. It takes actual resources in the chip to convert to do lookups into tables to find out what those uh, addresses actually are in physical. So there's a thing called a translation look aside buffer. Uh, again, not sure if I always get the acronyms right there, but what it is is something that can quickly, uh, ca it's, it's a, basically a cache, it's another cache that's there to cache address translation so that you don't have to redo address lookups for ranges that you're frequently accessing. So that's what that kind of stuff is for. And you've got one for data as well, right down here. 
Um, so then you can see all of this stuff here. This is the decoder. This is where we're getting uh, instructions. We're fetching 16 bytes. We're going into a queue. We're fusing instructions together. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we've got decoders. These are all decoders that are trying to decode instructions. You can see that there are multiple of them. Why are there multiple of them? Because every cycle, the chip tries to, if it can, uh, it tries to decode about four microops. It tries to have four new microops uh, every time, right? I shouldn't say four. Sorry, not four new microops. It tries to have four instructions decoded, even if that generates more microops. Now, as you can see here, there's a limit. Um, if you produce more than five microops by decoding these four instructions, you will get gated. So there's no way to actually push more than five microops from the front end. Um, except, and you can see here, when you have a micro-op cache involved, at which point it could be six, right? Um, so you can see there's so much stuff going on in here, right? But it all boils down uh, to just this one part here, which is that we're going to send all of these micro-ops. They're all eventually going to go into something that's whole point is to feed them to the whole, like, renaming, uh, scheduling, the whole execution port thing. Uh, and what you can see here is you've got a register alias table, which is the register allocation table I talked about before. That's the thing that tries to remember where everything is, right? Then you've got this piece here, which does a bunch of things that are like designed to sort of uh, eliminate code that doesn't need to be done. So for example, if you see idioms, they're called here, right? Um, if you see things in code that are like XOR the same, you know, XOR or register with itself, it'll just turn that into knowing that that register is zero. So it won't ever actually execute. It's a free XOR, right? It still costs you to decode it, but it won't cost you anything to execute it, right? Um, move elimination, same thing. If you move a register to another register, well, it doesn't actually have to do any work for that because all it's going to do is just rename that value in the slot table right, in the register alias table. So it's like, oh, you want to move REX to RCX? Okay, I don't actually do anything. I don't have to actually copy anything. All I do is change the tag on the slot that used to hold that to now, you know, say that it also holds this, right? Uh, so, so there's all these sorts of things that it can do to uh, precondition the micro-op that you actually generate to prevent you from having to tie up execution resources for doing things that don't actually need to be done. You then have the scheduler. You can see the scheduler here. Uh, so here's the register file. Um, <clears throat> so I, I was way off. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's 180 slots for integer and 168 for vector. So there's way more than I said. I th what did I say? I had 192 or something. I was way off. Uh, it's it's actually one. It's it's almost 192 for each. Uh, so what this means, right, integer physical register file is just talking about, like, general purpose registers, and vector physical register file is just talking about those wide, like those SIMD, right, SSE, AVX, that kind of thing. Here's all those execution ports, and each one of those execution ports has the stuff it can do. So integer ALU means basic integer operations, integer div means integer divide, integer mul means integer multiply, right? And you can see some of these are marked vect. Vect means it can do things from SSE, right, SIMD. Uh, so what you can see here is, like, looking at these ports 0, 1, and 5 are, like, the only ones that can do SIMD. The rest of these don't do any SIMD, right? So you have far fewer SIMD uh, resources than you have other things, which makes sense, right, because SIMD is very large, right? It's doing a lot of operations in one. Um, and then finally, you get you know back down to here, which is the, the subsystem. This is where you load and store data from. There's buffering there that tries to like assemble things into cache lines for pushing them out and all that sort of stuff. So line fill buffers are, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, and store buffer and forwarding. Forwarding is when you have somebody who tries to load something that you just wrote, and you don't want to have to like round trip out you know necessarily in some weird way. So you'll get things where you, you try to like feed things through. Uh, it, there's all this crazy stuff that happens in there, and yeah. So hopefully that's a, a reasonably good sort of whirlwind tour of what's happening here. As you can see, it's very complicated. This sort of thing um, is why sometimes if you're in a position where you're trying to do like hard, hardcore optimization, 
you start learning things that are just nuts that you never knew about before. Uh, and it also explains why some things happen that would otherwise be very inexplicable. Like, for example, sometimes you'll get situations where it seems like something should be able to execute at a certain speed, but it actually can't. And it turns out the reason is because the scheduler... It's just a piece of silicon. It's not a huge, like, crazy piece of software that has tons of cycles to spare to, like, do stuff. It has to be, like, extremely fast, right? Because it's the bottleneck on, on any operation. If it was to take a while, if the scheduler ever got slow, your chip would just stop doing stuff because, this, you know, the scheduler would become a problem. So it has to be so fast that no one's ever going to wait on it. As a result, it doesn't always make optimal decisions. Because you have heterogeneous ports over here, like, think about it. There's four int ALUs right here, right? That means anything targeted towards an int ALU could go to any one of the four. But other things, right, cannot. So a divide can only go here, and a shuffle can only go here. So imagine if the scheduler comes in and it has something that it needs to assign to an int ALU, right? And it has to pick one of these to use, right? And it, like, just doesn't quite do it right. And it turns out it should have put it into this one. And instead it put it into this one or whatever. Or it started a div and it really shouldn't have done that div start. It should have done something else and then done the div after because it would have paired better or whatever, right? It's not going to be optimal. Most of the time it's good enough that you won't care. But... I'm just bringing it up as like, this is why sometimes when you really decide you're going to optimize something to a crazy degree, you start learning stuff about the chip that's just like, whoa, because there's so much going on in here that there's strange edge cases you can hit that you'd never know if you're just running your code normally. But when you, if you actually try to go figure out how to get the maximum performance out of some particular microarchitecture, you start learning all these crazy things. That's the end of the first part. That's the simplified CPU diagram and then a little look at the real full complex CPU diagram that uh, Intel provides for us for their CPUs. In the next part, I'm going to go through how to look at the assembly language code, figure out what kind of microops it actually generates, and then how to look at how those microops will actually flow through the CPU to the extent that we actually have the ability to look at it. Because obviously these are proprietary chips with proprietary designs, and we don't necessarily know what happens in there. So it's more just from the high-level software point of view. I'm not a hardware expert, so I can't give you any inside details into how these things work. I'm just going to show you the tools that we typically use nowadays to figure out what's going on when we issue some assembly language. So I'll be back here for part two uh, and covering that. Again, all the links are in the description. So if you want to grab those, they're down there. And until part two, I hope you enjoyed part one and I'll see you on the internet.